Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dr. Patrick Green, Chief Executive Officer of Museum Victoria located in Melbourne, Australia. The museum's collection includes 16 million items organized within three priceless collections, sciences, indigenous cultures, and history and technology. Trained as an archeologist, Patrick Green began his career directing excavation sites in the United Kingdom, and in 1983, he became the inaugural director of Manchester's Museum of Science and Industry. In 2002, he became the CEO of Museum Victoria, the largest museum organization in Australia. Dr. Green has generously agreed to share some of his insights with us. And I'd like to thank you, Dr. Green, for joining us today. Pleasure, Mark. Museum Victoria is the largest such institution in Australia. Could you describe the scope of its collections and the scope of its operations? Well, the museum, as you say, has been going since the mid-19th century. 1854 was when it was founded. And during that time, uh, the collections have grown and grown and grown. Um, the natural science collections, of course, account for a very large number of those objects that we have. Uh, and these are areas, of course, where it's very important to keep collecting because uh, museums have this um, fantastic opportunity to talk about the changes in biodiversity over time. Uh, they're not just snapshots. They are a continuum of, of knowledge. And then the history and technology collections um, have been built up, and they are wonderful too. And they range from the sort of things which you would find in a technology museum uh, right the way through to a big project we've done, which is the largest family album project, where we've gone out to communities and said, would you share with us your family photos? And we digitize those, and people generously do, with great enthusiasm, and they can go onto our website and be used for exhibitions and so on. They have material from the area around us, the Pacific, Pacific Islands, but particularly rich in Australia's indigenous culture. And again, that's an area where we are continuing to collect. So it's a museum of place, but it is a museum of science. It is a museum of, of, of culture. It's also a museum of art. It, it, it seems to have a, a number of different identities. Uh, as well as being a public forum for, for an exchange of ideas. That's right. And since I took uh, over as CEO in 2002, we've broken down barriers between departments. We've, um, we've made uh, the flow of ideas much easier. And in consequence, we can, do, we can draw on all those areas which we encompass at the margins. When, when two subjects interlock, interact, and what comes out of that is something very fresh and very new, but particularly very relevant to the communities that we serve. So describe this notion of, of a networked institution as opposed to a hierarchically structured institution, as opposed to a stovepiped institution where the various departments are separate. You talk about a network organization. Is it, is it networked in terms of how the various curators interact? Is it networked in terms of how the infrastructure uh, works? We put a lot of effort into a whole range of activities which ensure that people talk to each other. That, that essentially is what it's about. So when I started, each of the museums had been set up almost as a separate and competing organization. Uh, each had its own marketing team. And uh, I remember with horror opening the, uh, the Age newspaper in Melbourne the first Saturday I was there and, and discovering different advertisements for the different museums on a competitive basis. It was a nonsense, and it was also very expensive nonsense. So by getting rid of that and recruiting, for example, our front of house staff um, to be able to work across the organization, and people can specialize in different areas, but they're part of a, the same group. Mm -hmm. The same goes for curatorial. We get lots of conversation taking place between our, our curators, our scientists, um, and, and so this goes hand in hand with a, with a real commitment to, um, to communicate, to communicate to our publics. Uh, and if you put all that together, you get something quite special. Uh, but the teamwork approach to projects is, is absolutely at the heart of this. Um, without a teamwork approach, it just wouldn't happen. And budgeting must be a very interesting pr uh, process now. It must be quite different than it was before you arrived. Yes, and it's done on much more uh, collective responsibility. So um, we have a five-person executive management team, which I'm a member, of course, uh, and we have our leadership team. 
and the Museum Victoria leadership team uh, covers all covers about 24 to 26 managers of different activities um, that do training together, that meet together, and when it comes to budget time, budget together. So we start off each year having to achieve a budget and get every person to contribute to that process. And in consequence, I have been extraordinarily impressed with the way in which individual managers have been prepared to see the big picture instead of always fighting a corner. That really doesn't happen. Um, and, it, you know, and there's never enough money to do everything we want to do, but actually establishing what the priorities are uh, across the organization, you know, with a very strong strategic plan, or a very good corporate plan, allows us to actually achieve that um, and achieve great value for money in the process. And it seems that you also need to have more of an adjudication process than perhaps you, you needed previously when people felt that they had their little areas that were somewhat protected. Um, is, is there a lot of dialogue during that budgeting process in which different departments uh, discuss how resources and common resources might be used and, and um, how they might be able to, to get the funding for their own uh, priorities? Yes, um, there's a lot of dialogue and, um, a, and a lot of discussion which then leads to a budget that everybody can agree to. Now, I say, there, you know, there will be pet projects which have had to be put on ice. That's right. always the case. Um, but what we, and then, uh, alongside that, we have built a culture of entrepreneurship on bringing in money so that if we can do better, you know, we're doing the budget, you know, two quarters out from the end of the financial year, and it gets more and more focused, if you like, as we get towards the end of the financial year, but we're never at the financial year when it's done. So if we could do better than we've planned in that final quarter, more money is released, and then that allows us to take um, projects off the reserve list and to fund those as well, and we've been quite successful in that. But also, um, we've encouraged managers to develop their own uh, fundraising skills, and there is a great enthusiasm to do that, and we've been very effective in bringing in money, not from the corporate sector necessarily, but certainly from foundations uh, and from uh, public sources, uh, government grants for research, for all sorts of things, actually. In terms of your, your own management style, there, there's, there's the, the extremes of being very directive yep. to being so consensus oriented that, that everything becomes a committee. How would you yeah. place yourself in that continuum? The, the danger of everybody talking about everything and not reaching a conclusion on anything um, is uh, clearly something we want to avoid. And the way to avoid it is to have a very good strategic plan. If you've got a good strategic plan with um, very clear, clearly defined goals, and we have, and it's a very short plan. Um, How long is it? Well, it's, it's, it's four sides. It's four pages. It's four pages. Uh, alongside that, then, we have the corporate plan, and we have you know, other plans all the way down to individual planning. And having the clarity of that means that we don't have people spending all their time fighting border disputes, which is what happens in a lot of museums. <laughs> and that is so wasteful, so wasteful of time, so wasteful of energy. Uh, it doesn't lead to creative outcomes. It leads to jealousies and so on. Um, we get on with it, and and um, and it, so it actually leads to uh, decisive, decisiveness um, in planning and decision making. So our planning process, our, our training process, links everybody into those goals. So they know where they stand. They know what they're contributing to, and that helps as well. It's interesting in that you're you're. Um, you're running a museum, but you're also helping people to work effectively. So yes. you, you seem to be paying attention to the business culture, the business processes, as well as the, the job of a museum. Is it true that museum, the job of museum directors is becoming increasingly uh, complicated uh, in, this, in this world? It's a job that calls upon a whole range of different um, experiences and skills. Um, which, which my view is that no one individual possesses, and that's where the importance of having a very good executive management team uh, is essential. 
uh, and I couldn't do what I do without my four colleagues on the executive management team um, because they bring tremendous strengths to it. And I, and I think um, one of the revelations I had um, early on in, in, when I was working in Manchester was uh, the concept of um, no individual can be perfect, but a team can be. So, so investing in training and, um, and team building to, is, is, I suppose, a hallmark of how I go about things. You have a, a visitor trajectory which is, which is quite impressive. Um, you have a, a, um, a budget to manage. Yes. Um, could, you, could you chat a little bit about those, those dimensional aspects? Eight years ago, nearly nine years ago when I started, when the museum was in trouble, I had asked all the right questions at interview and the board members had given me all the right answers, or right answers as they thought. Uh, but it turned out that the museum was heading for a big financial deficit, um, uh, a very big one, six million dollars in, in, in that financial year. And it requires a very urgent attention. Um, there was also the new museum, Melbourne Museum, had opened um, less than two years before. It, it, its uh, reaction from the public had been of disappointment, it wasn't as good as they expected. Uh, some of the press was extremely hostile to the whole venture. Uh, so there were a lot of issues to deal with. And, and of course, staff morale was, was pretty low as a, in consequence of all of that. And, and one of the factors was uh, visitation was dropping. There was this new museum. It had opened with less numbers than people had hoped for. It was too expensive to get into. The exhibitions weren't good enough. So we managed to persuade the government to give us some, some extra money which they did on the basis that we then saved money in subsequent years. So, it, so the money was, was <coughs> invested with strings attached? Yes, all money has strings attached. The strings were that, that you would pay the money back or that you would some be of able it. to, to the, pay some of it back? Yeah, that's right. But we also persuaded them to, re to give us extra money to reduce the prices of entry. Okay. And so we were able to reduce the, the, the entry price to just $6 for adults and free for children and concession card holders. And I'd had the experience in the UK of the free entry being introduced by the Blair government. Mm -hmm. And the museum I ran there went free and we saw a big lift in attendances and a broadening of attendances. Um, and I predicted the same thing would happen and it, and it did. But I've always believed it's not just money. It's got, the product has got to be right. The museums have got to be offering the right sort of exhibitions, the right sort of experiences. And so we've seen now um, a steady growth in the number of visitors to now we have um, over two million people come through our doors. Two million people? Yeah. And the population of Australia is? Just 22 million. 22 million. Spread across a very large continent. Uh, where Perth is, you know, four hours flight away and, and so on. And the population of, of Victoria is? Is um, about five and a half million. Five and a half million. Yes. So you have two million people coming to a museum located in Melbourne, yeah. or a series of, of institutions Melbourne, uh, located in Melbourne. Yeah. Drawing from a population of five million yeah. or 22 million. That's right. That is quite an accomplishment. It is. And in that number is another very interesting figure, which is we get over 300,000 school students visit us. 300,000 school students. Yeah, which annually. is, which is um, about a third of the entire Victorian school population visit us each year. So that means during a school career, um, a child is likely to visit the museum four or five times. And that's at, at, with school. It'll probably come at other times with their parents. And that makes a big difference to how we can relate to our audience because it means we have an audience that come and come back and that's very different to being running a museum say in Paris where you see your visitors once most of them are overseas visitors um, we have to relate to our visitors we have to keep them coming back otherwise our numbers are going to drop away very isn't, quickly isn't the comparison to to Paris a bit unfair simply because there are so many museum institutions in Paris, the competition is, is so intense and there's so many different choices. It's not the, the pure numbers I'm talking about here, it is the repeat visiting. And I mean, I'd be very happy to run a museum in Paris or London, but the difference is, and it's a difference I enjoy, that when you're running a museum in a place like Melbourne um, or here in Houston, you're getting people who will come 
that you need to establish a relationship with. And that's quite different to running the British Museum, where about a, only about a quarter of the people are people from the UK, and most of those will live in outer London. You know, a visit to the centre is something you do once every few years, whereas we see our people um, continually. And so in terms of the work we do, the work to um, change people's attitudes, for example, to inform, to educate, um, it's, a, it's a possibility which wouldn't be possible in some other places. What do you believe makes, the, makes that difference? Well, it's, um, in the case of Melbourne, there's, there's two characteristics. One is it's a city that's very easy to get around, unless you live in the outer suburbs where there's some real problems about transport. Um, and the, part of the culture of Melbourne is that people turn out. You put on any event, whether it's a sporting event, whether it's a comedy festival, whether it's you know, going to a museum, and people come. So what we did was uh, develop our own team inside to develop exhibitions, MV Studios, we call them, uh, with a very innovative approach to exhibition technology and exhibition techniques. Uh, the teamwork approach, which I mentioned before, is essential to that, um, and make use of the skills we had in-house, because the museum, when it had opened, had, had outsourced most of its exhibitions. And a lot of people felt that their knowledge hadn't been used in the exhibitions, and it, ha and it didn't have the passion of the staff. Now I can tell you, the museum's exhibitions we develop have that passion. And then you also bring in outside experts to develop your exhibitions, including uh, bringing in people who understand different technologies and, and using technology to leaven the, the whole experience for audiences. Could you talk a bit about uh, some of your recent work? Well, one of the things which um, I inherited, and I'm very grateful to my predecessors for putting it in place, was a great strength in information, multimedia, and technology. So we have in-house a, a, a great strength, which we can then, and, and on that basis, we can then work with a whole range of other people. So, for example, uh, we've just opened a, a long-term gallery called Dynamic Earth. It's about the story of the Earth, it's geology, it has a thousand um, beautiful specimens within it, but it also is put in the context of um, an Earth which is has been shaped and it continues to change as a result of all sorts of different factors, one of which is, is volcanoes and volcanology. And in the centerpiece of this exhibition, we have a 3D experience in which people stand and 12 projectors um, subject them to um, an amazing array of volcanic activity, lava flows and so on. It's not film, it's coming directly from the computer and it has the capacity for people to interact with it. It's very difficult to describe, it has to be experienced. So people are wearing 3D glasses. Yes, it's, it's 3D so it's very engaging. Now we've developed it on the back of previous projects we did. We developed a project based on a World Heritage Site in India called Hampi, um, which we are now exporting to India. It's about to start a tour, and that is a series of virtual environments, which you can enter wearing glasses, of panoramic digital photography. And that in turn was based on something we call the virtual room, which we developed with innovation money from the Victorian government. So. Um, developing innovative technology is part of what we're about and we do that as you say with partners and we look for all sorts of partners to work with. So you take pure t pure technology you create a, you create a series of applications in partnership with, yep. with with others. Yes. You get funding to drive the further development of that technology yes. and, and, and to experiment with the application of these technologies yes. and then at, at, at the end of the day you're exporting now those technologies, those exhibitions, to others. Yes, uh, outside, right. and, and and I understand that that some of these technologies also have uh, some commercial uses as well. Uh, they do. Um, the the sort of technology is now being used by the mining industry in Australia uh, to train uh, miners on health and safety issues, so that it's possible to be in an experience, uh, a three D experience, and experience um, rock falls, roof collapses that sort of thing, which you wouldn't want to experience for reality. For mining companies, this is um, technology which allows them to do it in entire, safe, in entire safety, but extremely vividly. And I'll give you another example. We've opened another exhibition recently uh, called Wild, Amazing Animals in a Changing World. 
And this has brought out of storage s over 700 animal specimens, stuffed specimens, mm -hmm. which we have displayed in a, in a beautiful space in great tiers going up. Now, how do you label something like that? You can't have a label on everything. It, they're too far away. Right, it, would destroy, it would destroy the whole aesthetics of it anyway. So there, what we've developed, again with our partners at the University of New South Wales, is um, some we, something we call panoramic navigators. And on a screen, visitors can turn a screen, and on, on it they can see all the animals, and then they can touch an animal, and all the information about that animal come up, come up on that screen. And kids go in, instinctively they know how to use it, and they will tell the grown-ups how to use it. And, um, and, and that's being looked at I know by at least one major American museum. So you have interactive hyperlink um, facility so that you can actually see the exhibition. You yep. can actually see in three dimensions these, these materials that might have been collected in um, 1883 yep. or, or uh, 1910. Yes. Uh, you can experience them, get close to them, but then you can also gain access to all the information on That's the right. specimen. That's right. And you can download that information on your phone, if you want to, through Bluetooth. Uh, and when you go home or before your visit, each of the exhibitions we open now has its website fully developed. And this is part of, of having a joined-up museum, have it, having a network museum, that, that as an exhibition opens, um, we're ready with everything. We're ready with the marketing materials, we're ready with the educational materials, we're ready with the public programs for adults, we're ready with the website. And so we have very rich website resources as well. So is Museum Victoria actually pursuing a, what, what is in commercial environments called a clicks and mortar type strategy in which um, you, you certainly have your buildings, you have your collections, you have your physical space, but um, are you pursuing a strategy that, that, that takes the museum and starts to invert it and redefine the experience of what att attending a museum uh, constitutes? Yes, I believe that's true. And, um, and, and so, for example, we've just opened another exhibition at our immigration museum called Identity, Yours, Mine, Ours. Um, Melbourne, Victoria, indeed Australia. It's a multicultural society, and, and Melbourne is particularly so, but a multicultural society in which uh, members of the community are at ease with each other doesn't just happen, it needs to be worked at. And so we play our part in that through the Immigration Museum by telling the story of migration, but in the case of the, of the uh, identity exhibition, talking about well, what is my identity and, um, and building appreciation of each other and understanding of each other. And that's alongside public programs that we do and, and, and a whole range of other activities. So we have a, a clear social role there. Um, and in that we use technology. We never start with the technology. We start with the narrative. What is it that we want to say? And then we find the technology which allows us to do it. To start with the technology would be a mistake. It really is just a matter of the tools of the trade. And choosing the right tool for the right thing. We, we've just developed two iPad applications. We were the first museum in the world to develop one. Um, and one is, uh, helps you on your visit around um, Melbourne Museum. Or if you're not at Melbourne Museum, you can still explore it. But the second one is um, a field guide to the wildlife of Victoria. And, um, and this has had rave reviews, it's a tremendous enthusiasm not just from people who live in Victoria, but from across the world who are downloading uh, what would take, you know, a pile of books this high to explore, to find, you know, that bird, that frog, um, that sea anemone in the sea, uh, that snake. Um, you know, we, it's possible to interrogate the, um, the iPad and find all this information. You can um, uh, get frog calls, for example. Uh, so. It's very exciting to see the way in which these technologies keep rolling along and the way in which it's possible to um, include them in a museum context. Well, Dr. Green, it's a fascinating narrative and, and an ongoing narrative that you are uh, bringing to the, to the world and to the people of Australia. Thank you so much for your insights and thank you for sharing. Thank you.